we're a little behind. Let's uh, let's pray, and we'll we'll go ahead and begin. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you you bless us in this life by sustaining us with your means of grace, and especially the Holy Sacrament that comes and gives us Jesus Himself, gives us the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of our sins, and and uh, provides us bread from heaven in this life as we pilgrimage our journey in the wilderness. Lord, bless us as we study receiving and being true to what you have put down in your word about receiving both body and blood of our Lord in the sacrament. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about uh, both kinds in the sacrament, uh, and that's receiving um, bread and wine, body and blood. Um, and which may not be a really big issue. It's not a big issue for Lutherans now, although it does come up um, in um, practice sometimes when people talk about, um, well, can I just have uh, a host? Can I just have the body as opposed to um, the blood or wine? Because I'm either wine makes me nauseous or some people have an allergy apparently to alcohol um, and um, or people who are recovering from um, some kind of alcohol abuse as well. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about how this sort of originates. It, it, uh, it leads us down the way the Roman Catholic Church developed, uh, giving uh, only the host uh, to uh, Christians um, developed because of a logical thought process. Um, and uh, it leads them to do some other things now, too. But um, we'll look at all that. The church has been really super inconsistent uh, throughout history about uh, what's right to do, both kinds or one kind. Um, and again, our, our Lutheran confessions are sort of looking to what does God's word say and using that as the rule of faith the thing that norms how we uh, believe. So in the beginning there, um, at the very top, there's going to be a change in the articles, and you can kind of see that starting to happen. Um, and the previous 21 articles um, were pretty um, pretty nice, I think, uh, <laughs> trying to reconcile the differences between uh, the Lutherans in Germany and the Roman Catholic Church. And now we're going to get to the more zestier part of it, um, even though I would think justification and things like that were pretty zesty. But uh, this one is is speaking uh, for the next subsequent articles when we talk about um, the Lord's Supper and different aspects of it, especially the mass. Uh, so Article 24 is about the mass. It's about the divine service and probably the greatest conflict Luther had uh, with the Roman Church was what took place in the mass. Um, and that is the re-sacrificing of our Lord in it um, and the taking away of the, the people receiving the benefits by participating in the service. And I'm, when I say participating, I don't mean like, uh, you know, lectern reading or something like that. I mean, like the service is actually proclaiming the gospel to the people and they are receiving that gospel in both word and sacrament. Um, and that has, uh, by, by the time Luther's time and in the medieval church, I mean, it, it had become something totally different um, than, than what it was uh, prescribed to in scripture when you talk about the divine service or the mass. Um, and then confession, we talk about the priesthood, priests being married, foods and fasting, and then the power of the church and the bishop, which is a big um, issue as well. So. So yeah, you can see that uh, we were nice at first, and now we're kind of taking off the gloves and not holding anything back. Um, so I'll read the article. It is rather long, um, but uh, it's I just put it under the things that we confess because we confess the whole thing. There are a bunch of errors that we're identifying, but uh, we'll, we'll break it down piece by piece. So the Laity, this is in Lutheran churches, the laity are given both kinds in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper because this practice has the Lord's command. Drink of it, all of you, from Matthew 26. Christ has clearly commanded that all should drink from the cup, lest anyone misleadingly say that this refers only to priests. 
In 1 Corinthians 11, 24, Paul cites an example. For this, it appears that the whole congregation used both kinds. This practice has remained in the church for a long time. It is not known when or by whom or by whose authority it was changed. Uh, and then it mentions a cardinal here who at one time, uh, when it was approved, I mentioned Cyprian in some places, which is a church father we'll talk about, testifying that the blood was given to the people. It mentions St. Jerome, which we'll talk about, testifies the same thing when he says the priests administer the Eucharist and distribute the blood of Christ to the people. Um, and indeed, there's a pope uh, that commands that the sacrament not be divided. And we won't read the Latin uh, transcript where he puts that in, but uh, only a recent custom has changed this. It is clear that any custom introduced against God's command is not to be allowed, as church law bears witness. Uh, this custom has been received not only against the scripture, but also against old canon law and the example of the church. Therefore, if anyone preferred to use both kinds of the sacrament, they should not have been compelled to do otherwise as an offense against their conscience. Because the division of the sacrament does not agree with the ordinance of Christ, it is our custom to omit the procession with the host, and we'll talk about that, which has been used before. All right, so first up, Christ has clearly commanded that uh, all should drink from the cup. Um, it's pretty explicit in Scripture when, when the Lord institutes his supper, um, and when Paul talks about it um, predominantly in 1 Corinthians. So Matthew 26, where the, uh, uh, the article cites, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, uh, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And so it's pretty clear. I mean, this is this has always been uh, Lutheran theology. When you talk about the Lord's Supper, you know, why is it Jesus body and blood? And that's because Jesus says it is. I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, and uh, why do we give both kinds, both the cup um, and the host, uh, to uh, lay people, to all of God's people? Uh, and that's because Jesus said to do these things, um, and there wasn't really a distinction. This is also mentioned about uh, everyone taking the cup, um, both kinds, in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 10 and Luke 22 and Mark 14, right? So uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the ones that sync up pretty well together, they all have the Lord's Supper. Um, and of course, John's gospel doesn't have the Lord's Supper in it. Um, it focuses on the foot washing. Um, and uh, probably because the other three gospels had already been written, and uh, John is providing a different sort of view for, for those uh, on what was happening. Um, so yeah, there's no distinction made here, uh, what's to be consumed and what's not. Um, and again, the Passover meal, right, um, that the Jews celebrated that's prescribed in Exodus, um, everybody was participating in that, um, eating and drinking in the Passover even children, uh, but we won't talk about that in terms of the Lord's Supper uh, today. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, everyone was involved in that. So there was no distinction, even in the Old Testament, when God gave the, the Passover feast as a foreshadow for the Lord's Supper. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he's, <laughs> you certainly have to do some gymnastics to get there. And the, the funny thing is, um, in the Roman Catholic response to this, they don't really um, they don't really make an argument from scripture, right? Because they can't. Um, they make an argument from, from canon, from church law. But uh, we'll see that that has changed um, pretty dramatically throughout the years, has been very inconsistent. Um, and of course, then they solidify this. They make it official in the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent, which again, we, we've talked about 
you know, did a lot of things at the council. Yeah, that was their that was their angry time. So uh, that was when um, that's when they created a new church. I mean, frankly, when was that? Uh, the Council of Trent was fifteen. I don't know if I have it on here. Fifteen forty five. It began. It, the councils didn't last a year; they lasted for several years. Um, so that is a long meeting. Yeah, yeah. Most church councils lasted a while. Well, you know, you got to give time for people to travel, right? So the bishops and the the hierarchy of the church travel to a location that takes time, um, and then you know, it's like uh, it's like trying to have a church service after a Lenten fellowship meal. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer for people to get settled. That's a short distance. <laughs> That's a short distance. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the, the council. Um, so uh, the next part of the article says, lest anyone misleadingly say that this refers only to priest in 1 Corinthians 11, 27, Paul cites an example for this. Uh, it appears that the whole congregation used both kinds. Um, so let's do a little breakdown of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, and we'll look at verses 27 uh, all the way to 29, and I've got it sort of laid out here. It's funny, I just put all this together before this class um, uh, when we talk about a take-home thing for the confirmands. So our confirmands are going to have their uh, early communion um, on the 1st of May, and I sent... Uh, we. I've been talking with them and uh, I sent something home with their parents to have a discussion with them. Um, and, uh, and we talked about what does Paul's uh, sort of, uh, what he's speaking against in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he talks about uh, those who eat and drink to their condemnation um, in regards to the Lord's supper and um, what he means in, in uh, having the supper worthily. So what does that mean? Um, and so spoilers for the confirmands, it's not, um, it's not about mental, right? It's not about having a set group of knowledge in order to have the Lord's Supper. If it was all about knowledge to partake in the Lord's Supper, then a lot of people would be excluded, right? Um, and, you know, uh, probably not anyone here, right? But there are some folks who have never cracked open their small catechism in, you know, 50, 60 years. And so, um, so it's not about knowledge. Um, it's about, um, this is what the small catechism says, belief in these words, right? Faith in these words given and shed for you. Um, and so um, the compromands certainly have faith in that. Uh, and uh, uh, and they're, they're excited. Yeah. And plus, to be honest with you, uh, the having first communion with confirmation is a really it's a very Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod practice for about 100 years. But before that, it's been really all over the place. Um, and at Luther's time, they weren't even really doing confirmation all that much. Uh, at, at the, there's points in Lutheran history where confirmation is not even done. And Luther is communing kids as young as age six. Um, because again, they can have that knowledge of believing. Actually, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, they probably believe it better than we do. And I'll, I'll give you an example that Natalie actually told me about Maddie. Maddie, uh, when she sees uh, either Pastor Shroshine or myself up there, that she thinks that's God. Yeah. And and I was like, yeah, oh, that what a wonderful thing. Not because I'm like, you know, that's me, but because, uh, you know, she hears those words coming out and in the service and she believes them without any sort of reservations about that. And so um, what, what a wonderful thing that, I, that I is. Share one more thing. Yeah. I kept, I kept meaning to tell you and to tell Ashley, it was last week, uh, while, we, while we were singing the kids, we do prayers at the end. And Maddie said, I want to pray and thank God that my mom is now in Bible study. Yeah. Oh, so, <laughs> yes. And I was like, I need to tell Ashley for Barb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very good. So it was like the sweetest thing ever. Yeah, Matthew yeah. 18, yeah. they asked, <laughs> uh, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called to him a child. 
And he placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. She's a good example of how we're supposed to be becoming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she she doesn't have any 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 stumbling blocks to faith. And, you know, Jesus makes the point, too, that when he uses the word ch child in those passages, um, the word for child is like a technon, um, in the Greek, and um, he he really uses in the context of that, he's talking about infants. He's bringing infants there. And so because... Um, because we're born with that love for God. It's life that strips it away from us as we get older. Well, yeah, they don't have the problem with reason at that point. And then also um, children, especially infants, are 100% dependent on other people. And God wants you to teach teach you that as well. He wants you to be absolutely dependent upon Him in every way. Um, so uh, at the bottom of page one, and then starting on the second page, First Corinthians eleven, right? The occasion that Paul is writing to the church in Corinth um, is about a growing concern of the church's behavior and attitudes. And if you know anything about First Corinthians, they're off the chain there, doing all sorts of weird things. Uh, one of which is also getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. And um, so there's different aspects, and he's writing to them at this point about worship and communion. And so in chapter 11, Paul highlights his concerns with respects. Uh, he gives directives, right, in verse 17 of it. Um, so then just to break it up a little bit, in verse 28, Paul says, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Um, and so uh, our Lutheran faith has always uh, long believed that that's recognizing, examining yourself before you eat and, and drink, recognizing that it is the body of our Lord Jesus in the supper um, and uh, the blood of Jesus in the wine. Um, and uh, there's a little Greek word there uh, about examine. It's rightly, judge rightly and recognize it calls us to sort of weigh the evidence uh, that Jesus says it is what it is. It doesn't mean comprehending or understanding, which uh, you may say that sounds like the same thing, recognizing, understanding, comprehending, but it's not. Um, I mean, and here's an example, right? I can recognize nuclear engineering, that it is such a thing, right? But I don't, I neither comprehend nor understand its dynamics. So I recognize that Jesus is, bodily present. He's really there in the Lord's Supper, um, but I don't comprehend or understand the full dynamics of how that happens because it's a mystery, um, and that's how Paul describes it as well. Um, and so miracles are, and we said this before, right? Miracles are mysterious. You can't explain them. Every time we gather for the Lord's Supper, it is a miracle because Jesus is there with us in a miraculous way. And so um, just like you can't explain Jesus' miracles or any miracles in, the, in Scripture, um, you can't really explain the dynamics of them uh, in, in this life as well. So, Pastor, do you think that if we... You know, once we once a believer gets to the point where they're they be, they believe they know that the Lord is present in that sacrament. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I feel drunk in that realization, not not intoxicated like yeah. you think, but I'm almost like oh, like you know, right? Oh, there's a joy. Yeah, it it's should be a, celebrated. Yeah, it's yeah. Almost, there's almost an intoxicating effect to it if you think of it that way. Yeah, but you know, certainly not. And, and I think that's, I mean, so um, I think you've asked me this one time, too, about being joyful, coming to the Lord's Supper. And uh, uh, <laughs> and so there is a joy. So I think a lot of people come up to the to the altar for uh, uh, to receive the Lord's Supper and um, they want to be reverent. Right. And you want to be it's serious. Right. Um, but it's and it's solemn. But solemnity doesn't really mean that it's something that's like, you know, a, a, a burden to you or that needs to be, you know, uh, classic 
uh, German family photos from the 19th century, uh, you know. But you so, should be reflective and aware. Of you should be reflective and aware. You should be reverent because you're before your Lord, but it is a wonderful, joyous trial. thing. It's not a bad thing. No, it's not. Because all, I guarantee you on the last day when Jesus returns, we're going to be smiling. I'm going to be flat on my face kissing his feet. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, it'll be... I'll have a big smile on my face, I guarantee you. You know, there, there'll be a fear of the Lord, but it won't be a fear as in he's going to destroy me. An interesting oh, yeah. discussion or just some, uh, uh, something smile. to... Yeah. Yes, <laughs> everybody starts smiling. <laughs> something to think about, an interesting discussion, probably not for this Bible study, but there was a pastor who posted... An, uh, well, I don't remember. Oh, God, it seems... Um, and he said that you should not go up and take communion with your children no. because um, they were a distraction from the moment, from what you're experiencing up there. And so I don't know. I just wanted to open up that for discussion and see where that was. Yes. That was he's a Lutheran pastor. Yeah, um, I don't. Um, I, I don't agree. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. I don't think yeah. Jesus would agree. Yeah, I knew. <laughs> since you, I mean, since you asked the question, I want to tell you something. You kneel when you receive Always. the Lord, and I look at that and I think with with Mary and and Nathan and Ben beside you, they're seeing that their mom and dad, who are strong people, kneel before the Lord. The penitent man kneels before the Lord. <laughs> I think it's probably the, the best and most natural thing we could ever do for our kids is to have them communion. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree completely. But but you're, we yeah. always know for communion. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't get up now right. with, yeah. with my knees. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. Yeah. Preferably, we could put it to kneeling where else in the future, maybe up there on the altar. But Something they'll, always remember, that. That. they'll yeah. always remember that no matter how mom felt or how whatever. Yeah, and think, she went I to receive the sacrament. It's, she, it's important yeah. for the family, I think. And how sweet is it for them to receive that blessing? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, 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 uh, so wonderful. Yes. So the pastor that you mentioned. He's um, very um, right. He is, uh, he's a very faithful, wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And so what he's doing is he's coming from a position of saying, he we have a hard enough time to believe the truth in what's the sacrament right that jesus is truly present which is why we do all the things we do around the supper and so uh he's coming from the point of focusing really on that yeah he's saying a mother cannot be focused on the sacrament if right. they're if i'm taking communion and i'm like mary shh, you know or ben stop picking your nose you know right. <laughs> like, so i i see what he's saying right but i, I don't agree and and he also i, I can pause you for can just that you can multi that that moment yeah right yeah. i've got I've and got, I've well been doing this for years yeah, yeah. you yeah. can you can sure. the kids can, and still yeah. what you need to do. because i'm a mother right yeah. Yeah. well yeah. god's yeah. given you those kids yeah. Yeah. and he's charged you yeah. we talked about it last night he's charged you with the responsibility and yeah, he'll judge you in that responsibility. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a. So, how a, am I caring for them and keeping my responsibility if I left them in the pew? Yeah, I think I would. Like, yeah, I think I think I think again. I mean, that's probably just a matter of of um, a different viewpoint, different opinion on it. I think that's probably one of those things that can vary. Yeah, it's, just inter it's interesting say, discussion. Right? Yeah. Yeah. it's interesting just, discussion. When, when I grew up, with was in our church. Have children. The pastor yeah, was would that, have that what he's saying? Like the church kids. service, yeah. and then the or kids would be excused. Right. And then they'd yeah. have yeah. Yeah. a meeting in while we were in school. Right. Yeah. Because he's never the one. Maybe it was a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. Stop that. We're going to have everybody there. You know, start again. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. I um, uh, it's I don't think I think I don't think it's a good thing to have to separate um, children and adults, old and young. That's never happens in in scripture. It never happens in the early church in worship. They're always together. So, um, and you know, it, it is a um, you, you should commune with your family. It's a very I mean, it's it's the most intimate. thing Thing that we do mm -hmm. and That's what God calls for us to do anyway is not to separate he calls for us to join right. together in this mm -hmm. so so I think uh yeah I mean um because I got news for you you're communing communing with your family members who are in heaven at yeah, that moment too yeah. so yeah. um so I mean it's uh um 
Yeah, it's a good thing. But I mean, he he comes from a certain point, you know, um, and uh, and I can understand that. But how old is he? He's he's, uh, he's rather older. He's a grandpa now, right? I think he might be a great grandpa. Okay. Yeah. yeah he has eight children, so it's it's strange that, about his argument. That, that's you know very strange mm -hmm. that he would take that position. Yeah, he's a very faithful man. Mm -hmm. He's the man that was on his hands and knees. Um, yeah, I think it's lapping up. There was so I went to a conference for the same publication, Godestines, yeah. at St. John's uh, in Mattoon, and um, you know they have a divine service, and um, there was an, an accident, and some of the chalice spilled, and um, you know we talk about this in seminary where where um, I don't know if I talked about this. It, we we talk about it in seminary where if something spills, you clean it up reverently. That's why I have those those yes. little cloths purificators up there too. And but you know you you believe the things that we confess and believe what that is. And so it was actually really impactful for me to watch a man who was, I think he's in his late seventies at mm -hmm. least, yeah, on his hands and knees uh, in the chancel at, at St. John's. You know. Okay kissing the floor and and licking it up okay, and um i mean he believes what he, you know that's yeah, belief yeah. and that's i mean that's the right thing to do and but it is a surreal thing to see well, um, that's the beautiful thing i think for me within god's plan and will is that number one as as christians and as oh, lutherans we have the ability to discuss the these things that these minute such, differences sure like but also <laughs> in the same in the same perceived dif difference that we have, you see tremendous examples of reverence right. from the same person. Right. Yeah. That's the beautiful part. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, getting back to where we were at, uh, verse 27, right? Paul says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood. This is where uh, the Roman Catholic Church would say that's why the priest gets it, because we don't want somebody to drink um, the cup in an unworthy manner. manner. Um, and uh, um, we don't want the, the, the blood of Christ to spill. And so the likelihood of it spilling is much less when you have a, a smaller group of people consuming it. Um, and so... Uh, um, Again, but when Paul talks about this guilty of sinning in an unworthy manner, he's talking about not recognizing the forgiveness of sins that the body and blood, you know, give, and that recognizing in faith that it is the real presence of our Lord within the context for what he's writing. Um, and so people that don't recognize that um, should abstain from the supper. I don't know why they would take it in the first place because they, it does, they're, they're confessing it doesn't really do anything and isn't really anything. Um, but Paul also says in verse 29, for anyone who drink, eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself, uh, condemnation. Um, and in the Corinthian church, they were getting literally sick. Um, and so there's, there's a judgment passed by the Lord on that as well. The Roman Catholics would say it all goes around this, this idea of commitments, commitments, um, which means uh, an existence together or in connection with one another. So is here, a spelling error or is that a different word? That's con, a different. Concomitance? Uh, con, yeah, concomitance. Yeah, it's a difficult word. I don't know. I have con get the with. Yeah, mm -hmm. with, yeah. <laughs> existence together. It's just strange. It means not without commitment. <laughs> no, it means with. No, it means with. Con, con is with. Oh, con is with. All right. Yes. So it means yeah, in connection to one another, and so in in the context that that the Roman Catholic Church is teaching about the Lord's Supper, they would confess the same things that we would confess. To be honest with you, in in when we uh, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, what was it, Article Ten of the Augsburg Confession? You know, we're believing the same thing. We believe the same thing, and. Uh, the, the problem with it is um, they take that logic and try to apply it where God has not revealed that information. So, I mean, do we do Roman Catholics and Lutherans both confess that Jesus is truly present in the Lord's Supper? Absolutely. Do. Real presence. Um, 
do they go one step far farther and use something they call transubstantiation to to say that the using philosophical terms to say that the bread and wine no longer exist it's only body and blood in order to explain how it becomes that and we would say well is it body and blood yes is it bread and wine yes yeah. and um do i know you know how that all happens no and i'm okay with that um i just i'm called to believe to have faith in that um but so Rome says it's Christ's body is present and it's Christ's blood. And so in this doctrine they developed, um, in connection with transubstantiation, they developed this custom of communion under one kind because they're going to say that if you have the body, a body has blood in it as well. And so you're obviously receiving the full benefit of the sacrament because you know your body has blood and it's Jesus' body and it has blood too. Um, Stretching. <laughs> right. So, uh, and, and it's something that develops pretty widely in the 12th century. And so if we look at it historically throughout the church, um, at the middle part here of page uh, two, you, you have the seventh century, there's this practice of intinction, okay? And that is dipping the wafer into the wine. Why? Um, because, and I have it right there, because lay people were <laughs> reluctant to receive the blood for fear of spillage. Okay, so, yeah. So here's the thing, right? We confess these things. There are probably things that, I know the compromands see them because they're up there, but you, I mean, you realize, I, I mean, I now I wash my hands, my fingers that I've touched the host with, if the want, with the water that's up there, and then I drink the whole thing, right? Because there, right, because there could be particles, yeah. And so you want to be, real about it. But again, um, the Lord never commands you to be fearful of spilling his blood in the sacrament, right? He doesn't say, you know, take and eat and then take and drink if you've got a really good bib or something like that. So, um, you know, he doesn't call you to do that. And you don't see the disciples acting like that. You know, they are receiving it. Um, and so if a spill does happen, you know, the seventh circle of hell doesn't open up and you get sucked into it. You know, you just, uh, you know, take care of things reverently in the best of your capability. Um, you don't want to be uh, blasphemous in the things you're doing. And then as a pastor, I don't want to teach very poorly. Right. Um, because again, to uh, uh, the pastor that we talked about before, his, his point is it is very hard to believe the things that we believe. I mean, it takes, it takes faith. It takes, um, uh, it, you know, it's the reason why we have all these different uh, things that we use, um, like a big silver chalice, you know, like a, uh, uh, like a big, you know, fine things, linens everywhere. And so, and different things that we do, uh, to confess that Jesus is present there. Um, Walk the talk. Yeah, yeah, we're practicing what we preach, yeah. So, uh, in tinction, though, we won't do that. That's not going to happen here. I'll just put that out right do now. some Lutherans practice it? Some do. I don't, it's not a good practice, and I don't know why they do it. Um, the Presbyterians do intinction quite a lot. And um, I wouldn't recommend doing anything Presbyterians do. And sorry, and uh, <laughs> and um, it, the the thought of is an in, in intinction, right? What's happening in the seventh century? It's century. It's not people taking a, a wafer and dunking it like Dunkin' Donuts. It's the priest when he's distributing the communion is doing that and giving it to you that way. Um, and it it reinforces the idea of receiving take and eat not so much me grab and do you know what i mean um and in the orthodox church they still do that and i think we've talked about this before so a lot of orthodox communion practices is to mix the bread with the wine and to give it to you via a spoon um that would be more likely to cause spillage mm -hmm. and so so this is what they would do they would have uh 
you know, and you can actually Google pictures of this big old chalice, right? They use leavened bread. They don't use unleavened bread in the, in the Orthodox church. They mix that with the wine, you know, they'd have it together with a spoon. They would put a plate under your chin and then you would consume it that way. And the, the priest would put the spoon into your mouth. Um, Soggy bread. Mm -hmm. That is too gross. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we have an aversion to soggy bread. Yeah. And, and and so it comes out of this this fear of not wanting to um, spill and to be very. Rep it comes out of a it comes out of a good thing. I think so. You know, they want to be very reverent and respectful with our Lord, which is the right thing to do. But when um, you know, and I don't know if the Orthodox practice Jesus doesn't really say anything against that you know what i mean he's not he's not uh, saying don't do that and you're still receiving them in the way that he you know he, he's saying and and unleavened bread leavened bread the word bread that jesus uses when he talks about the supper and when paul talks about it too in first corinthians uh, it just means bread it doesn't mean leaven or unleavened so we could use leaven we could use a loaf of bread if we wanted to did they have both kinds in in jesus time I always assumed that mostly the bread was unleavened, and that's what the they had both kinds. But he was celebrating the Passover. They used unleavened so bread in the Passover. More like a cracker type thing. Yeah, it would be more like a yeah flatbread. Yeah, I mean they still eat that over in, in the Middle East now. So um, pita pockets and uh, non bread. Yeah, kind of similar to that. Yeah, baked on these these big flat things, and, and they eat that all over in in the Middle East and in Africa and India and things like that. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be. And I and uh, and so I mean you you know you have to have natural wine, right? So you have to have you know you, you can't use strawberry wine. You have to use grape wine, the fruit of the vine, um, and uh, uh, you can't you know you can't have grape soda or something like that for the Lord's Supper. Um, but, um, but yeah, and, and without getting into it, because we're probably already behind, you can't, uh, when you talk about people that are uh, allergic to gluten, we don't, we don't do this here. We don't have anyone that really identifies that, but uh, gluten-free wafers, wafers made out of something other than grain. Um, I don't know if we've, our church at least not our church but our church body has really had a lot of discussion or thought about that because uh, they make you know gluten-free wafers and so can it really be truly bread in the sense that jesus is using in his uh um in the gospels um if it doesn't have gluten or it's made out of potatoes or whatever tapioca tough, though, sir. people have really really severe allergies yes or well, jesus christ is uh, is gluten-free yes mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> he's good for everybody mm -hmm. well and 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 again when you talk about somebody so somebody who has a problem with consuming something like that i mean he doesn't give a specification of like it has to be at least a half an inch diameter wafer you know what i mean or whatever mm -hmm. it can be a small amount of bread and a very small amount of wine so maybe that person just takes a crown or something or... right so i mean stuff stuff to work out and to think about um yeah i guess you have so um so uh, the church forbid uh the practice of intinction in a council there in 675 so still in the seventh century oops and, uh, Sorry about that. And um, uh, then it regained popularity again in the 11th century, um, only to be forbidden as incomplete communion uh, practice in the church. Again, when it says it regained pop popularity too, it, it does talk about uh, communion in one kind. So just receiving the host there. So in 1095 at the Council of Claremont, the church said, you got to have, that's incomplete communion. You need the full thing. No intention, uh, no just the host. Um, but the practice continued. Council of Constance in 1415, right? Um, there was a decree that Holy Communion under the form of bread alone could be distributed to the people. Um, and then in the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent in 1545, um, it's made official, reaffirmed that this is what we do. Um, practical reasons and out of spillage uh, became a custom for only offering one kind. And then if you go to page three in 1963 at the Second Vatican Council, 
um, the Roman Catholic Church restored the celebration of Holy Communion in both kinds, um, which has now become really the norm in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, for some, maybe more traditional Roman Catholic churches might still only do um, bread host. So um, all of that is to show that the church uh, as a whole has been back and forth. Um, and that was Luther's argument as well, right? It, you can't really argue with church uh, uh, by supporting your argument with church councils because councils have erred. They've been in error and been admonished by other councils, or they've contradicted each other in church councils. And so what are you supposed to believe? Um, and again, uh, it would be, you know, uh, it'd be great if God provided this, this thing, his word, you know, that would say, hey, do this this way or give you guidance in that. Um, and he does. So <laughs> um, identifying some people, right? Uh, uh, Nicholas of Cusa, right, is the Cardinal Cusinus. Uh, he was a German theologian uh, in the 14th century or 15th century, 1400s. Um, I don't know if he was a bishop or not. You guys know what a cardinal is when they say cardinal? Cardinals are like princes of the church. It's the guy in the red outfit. Right? Yeah. It's the guy in the red outfit. Yeah. So uh, the Holy See, the the, pap the, the, the Vatican, um, uh, the Pope appoints those people to, to be cardinals. Um, and those are princes within the, because the Roman Catholic Church is most definitely a um, developed like a like a kingdom with a king and an emperor and all this stuff like that. Um, and cardinals don't necessarily have to be uh, bishops or archbishops. They can be. Cardinals don't necessarily have to be priests. They can be lay people as well. And I think there is one example of that in history. Um, so um, I'm not sure about this guy. I, I would imagine he was probably a bishop. Cyprian uh, was the bishop of Carthage in the third century. So he's like um, He's the man, the myth, the legend um, before you have folks like um, Augustine, which we've talked about before, come into the scene um, in the fifth century. So uh, the uh, Cyprian, he's a church father. You know, he's a prominent leader in the church. He's writing um, and he's uh, developing things uh, for the church theology, working through heresies and things like that. St. Jerome um, was a priest in, in Stryden, uh, and which is, I don't know, northern Italy or maybe closer to like Albania or something like that. Um, and the fourth and fifth century, he's the one who translated the, uh, uh, the <clears throat> uh, Bible from Greek uh, to Latin. Um, so Jerome wrote the Latin Vulgate, which is what they're using at the time. So he carries a lot of weight in the church um, in terms of using him to support. And Jerome was uh, describes church worship in the fourth and fifth century, where the priest is giving both kinds in, in the sacrament to, um, to the lay people. Um, and then the Pope there, that one Bishop of Rome, um, uh, what is it? Gelatius, Gela, 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 Geladius, yeah. Uh, Bishop of Rome in the fifth century. Um, and again, I bet you in the fifth century, he wasn't, we're not calling him the Pope as in he rules the church, but he's calling himself the Bishop of Rome. It's much later, but he, he is uh, writing and giving examples of the lady receiving both kinds. So the bottom line is right. The church has been inconsistent on the practice in the communion of one kind. And so this is what we believe as Lutherans, we believe, teach, and confess that the only rule and norm are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testament alone. So how do we base our doctrine? Well, what the things that we believe, we base it on scripture uh, because, you know, shockingly, it's God's word, and that should be the first thing that we go to. So because of this division of the sacrament, um, didn't agree with how Christ had instituted his supper. Um, this is the last part of our article. It says, uh, it is our custom to omit the procession with the host, uh, which has been used before. Um, 
he's talking about a Eucharistic procession. You guys know what that is? where they bring it down the aisle and take it to the altar. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, been, I've seen it. I Yeah, I've got a, I got two pictures here at the bottom. Um, uh, a, a monstrance is like a, a big, kind of looks like a big sun, and they would take a consecrated wafer and they would put it in the middle of it. Okay, so if you're saying that Jesus' body, right, Jesus is bodily present um, in, the, in the Lord's Supper, the bread is now Jesus' body. Um, and so then, and that body also contains blood, right? So you're receiving the benefits with just one kind of communion. Um, then what they did was they followed that logical procession as to, well, we'll take the consecrated host and we'll elevate it, um, and put it into something that draws your attention and we'll process around with it and people can venerate it. People can offer their worship to it because it's Jesus' body. Um, so, and, and where that really comes from is this medieval sort of, um, communion faithfulness where people couldn't understand Latin, right? They didn't know what was going on. They weren't taught or catechized in that regard. So they go to mass, they don't know what's happening. Uh, but they do know that, you know, when the priest holds up this big wafer, that that's Christ's body, that that's Jesus. And so, uh, they, uh, they can look at that and say, oh, that is my God. I'm going to worship that. Um, because at that point in, in after the, the 13th century, communion practices go down, uh, frequency goes down extremely uh, small, probably once a year, right? People are going to, to communion. And, um, and so the church developed this um, theology of grace being... Uh, distributed to people by just paying devotion to the sacrament. So you don't have to go to church. You don't have to go and receive the sacrament. You can just look at it and that'll give you the benefits um, of receiving it. Uh, it'll give you something. And um, so then the practice of the, of the host being displayed and even processed through the town. So there's a feast for this of Corpus Christi, right? The, the body of Christ, um, and uh, where they would process through the town with the monstrance and, you know, and hold it. Um, and uh, the problem is, so is that Jesus' body? Yeah. But the problem is our Lord, one of the, what's the command he gives with the supper? Eat. To eat and drink it, right? He doesn't say parade it around the town or even, you know, to worship it in a sense. I mean, we do adore the Eucharist uh, because it is Jesus and it is he is giving us something in that sacrament. Um, but we want to be true to what his word says. And I, I don't know. It just kind of makes sense that way, don't you think? He didn't parade around with anything like one of these for any occasion yeah. he didn't he they would argue though that he there were periods of jesus parading i mean palm well, sunday yeah. so but but um but he didn't do that in the last supper no no in the church in in the new testament mm -hmm. is not doing that as well right i mean paul is writing to the corinthians who are blaspheming the supper I mean, they're being super naughty, okay? And he's still writing to them, saying that when they eat and drink in the Lord's Supper, so they're still doing that, that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, he shouldn't say, well, you guys are unworthy. Just put, put, the, put the bread into a big giant golden sun thing and parade it around the town. And so, um, but again, I, I think in the medieval church, you have this, because people are not taught, right? And the church service is not necessarily in the language that the people can understand. They don't know what's going on. And so superstitions sort of, right, creep in and develop. Um, and so you have all these things that come out of that. Um, and so uh, for that reason, we won't go to Latin in our divine service because nobody speaks it. <laughs> um, any, any questions? Um, any questions about this?
So I, the, the thing that, that comes up sometimes too is, is um, you know, somebody who actually we had this with, with um, somebody who had a, a nauseous over the, the wine. This is when we were still using um, the Mogan David and um, it made her nauseous. And so the question was, well, can we just, you know, give her the host and, um, and could we? Yeah, but let's try to be accommodating and true the best way we can. Um, to our Lord's words. Um, so what did we do? We took a tiny, tiny amount of wine and diluted it with a lot of water. Yeah. And it's still wine. And uh, and that seems to have done the trick. That would probably, if, if you were including children in, in this, that would probably be what you would do. I mean, that's what they traditionally did when the children had wine at the table. Yeah. You, you water it down a bit so that... Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that makes, uh, I think that, and I, the only thing is I don't think that probably works for people that are recovering. Well, yes. Um, but I think a microscopic, yeah, you know, I, I, a I, little I, dropper. I know of several people that are, and they would not even take a drop. Even take a drop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just and that probably addiction. depends on where you are in your recovery process too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that warrants a conversation. Um, it tells us to cleave away what makes us sinful. Mm -hmm. If if you if if a person is an alcoholic and they're recovering, maybe one drop of wine would be the thing that yeah. would make them say, "Oh, well." Well, I, I would push against that because the physician puts no poison in his cup, and so. That's true. Um, so, I mean, it, it was the same thing, you know. It would definitely be something that you would have to have discuss to talk about. I think yeah. it's a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. I think when you make sort of blanket rules about stuff, yeah. then you then you fall into categories that are, uh, here. here's a spicy take because we haven't really had any of those. You fall into categories of using individual cups only, okay, which happens a lot in the Missouri Senate and it happens in the early 1980s. And do you know why? because of the AIDS epidemic. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes. And I, I don't necessarily think it, 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 that was a wise thing. And so... Um, I just don't like drinking after other people. I know. I've always found that objection. <laughs> but, I don't even think about it, which is weird. I never... Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, if we're a family, I mean, I drink after our own kids, and sometimes that's disgusting. I drink after all of you, you know. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't think there's anything wrong with it, I, and I'm you know we offer both both right, um, and uh, and I'm glad now that we have both to offer. So we're never taking something away; we're just adding to, just like kneeling. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one day the Lord will bless us with uh, you know uh, the ability for those who would like to kneel to kneel. I and, hope so because I think there are a lot more than just me that want to kneel. But yes, you can kneel. and those that that do not or cannot. I absolutely right. could not. Yeah. So so then there is no law. Like yeah. kneeling. Yeah. 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 Something soft to land on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but here's the thing that's behind what we're talking about today is the church and your pastor has no right to burden your conscience where the Lord has not put a command there. So does the Lord command you to, to kneel? Mm, well, he does say every knee will bow, but there isn't a command to kneel at the supper in that regards. And so it's open to those, uh, to, to, to your conscience. Some people may feel convicted to do so, and some people may not even have the ability to do so. And, and the Lord does not condemn in that. Um, and so um, that's really what's happening here, too. So the church was saying you cannot give someone the blood of Christ. And, and the article at the very end, too, makes this statement that you can't bind consciences where the Lord, for one, has explicitly said you'll do this, right? And two, uh, where you have the freedom in the gospel to do so. Uh, you, you don't have any, any, uh, any right to do that. Um, Next chili cook-off fundraiser for the meal. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, and I'll tell you what I, the um, the confirmation kids want to kneel, and um, and maybe should be able to kneel. and maybe that's a good <laughs> well, thing. I think that's an important thing for kids because it teaches them 
not only reverent submission to our Lord in their, in their way, but it also teaches them submission to authority in a lot of way, because they'll recognize authority and, and recognize, well, this is something that I don't push against. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it can be a good thing. And, um, and as somebody who um, jumped out of airplanes for a long time, I can say there are moments when when uh, you won't be able to get when back I kneel and I, I have a hard time getting back up. So um, I can actually think at my ordination, mm -hmm. not here, not, not the installation, but the ordination in, in at uh, Faith in St. Robert, I, I actually had to, he had to give me a hand to mm. pull me back up. Cause praise God. Yeah. I, <laughs> praise God. Hey, Pastor, praise God. You're getting more meat here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I've got, I've got two strapping boys, little boys yep. to pick yeah. me back up. There you go. Yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll grab you. Uh, With the short skirts. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, oh, man. Man. we'll have to. <laughs> Dresses, I know. Thanks. Yeah. And you should have tried to. You should have tried to do the maternity dress. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That was <laughs> right. Yeah. I did it once, holding a newborn baby, yeah. which was very awkward. Right. Yeah. Um. Well, let's pray. We'll close this out. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your your word is truly a, a light to our path, a, a lamp to our feet, a guide in this world to show us what your good and holy will is. And Lord, bless us as we study that and we hold ourselves under the authority of your word and that we receive the benefits that you give and the promises that you provide for us in both word and sacrament. And, and we confess those things and we believe them because you say they are true. Lord, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Pastor, you did pull the study in at 11.56. So you delivered all of your material, and we had some stimulating discourse.